want to do today then is to present some preliminary findings of a qualitative content analysis of print media coverage of South Hill and Baldenfer Weston, appearing in three national and one local newspapers. And the time period is the 1st of March 2009 to the 31st of March 2011. Now in 2008, as most of you will know, the Irish government announced a plan valued at 3 billion uh, to completely regenerate four of Limerick's most deprived housing estates. That was 1.6 billion from the state and 1.4 billion from private investors. And this was to include South Hill and Ballinfer Weston, and the time period was 2009 to 2018. The plan included reference to social regeneration through community and educational initiatives, as well as better policing. But much of the plan focused on physical regeneration such that these states would become, and I quote, unrecognisable. The period of this study spans the first years of the regeneration process. It examines, examines the key frames used in explaining these states, their regeneration, and the manner in which it was framed to the public. Now, I should say that in doing so, we approach the mainstream media through the lens of political economy. As diverse as the voices and the politics of individual journalists, the issues and the understandings which achieve dissemination we feel need to be understood in the light of commercial concerns rather than any notion of corporate media and public service. This analysis of mainstream media framings of Limerick's most deprived public housing states therefore provides us firstly with insights into the manner in which the public understanding of these estates and official actions towards them are shaped by the ownership structures of the media through which they are communicated. Within that context, then, we also examine the competing framings of the estates and their regeneration to which the public are granted access. In this presentation, we consider in particular elite framings of the estates and their residents, and we reflect on the insights that these provide into the kinds of rationale that inform official approaches to the regeneration process. So what did we find? Well, first of all, and unsurprisingly, and in line with the findings of, of um, previous research that we had uh, conducted on Moy Ross, uh, we found that crime was the, the primary theme of most of the articles published on these estates within the two-year period examined. In fact, <coughs> the theme of crime accounted for over 70% of all of the articles. Um, one of the things that we were particularly interested in in this preliminary analysis, and I should note that obviously this has generated huge amounts of data that we're still working through, we've been working through for a while, but we were interested given the time period in how does uh, media coverage of regeneration itself, specifically on the theme of regeneration, then fit into that overall picture. And what we found was that only one of the three national publications in the South actually published more than one article on regeneration in the two-year period under consideration. Very low level concentration where the primary theme is specifically on regeneration. At the level of the national media, the newsworthiness of these estates, we found emanated not from the shocking levels of deprivation or unemployment or educational disadvantage experienced by their residents, and not even from the very hopeful initially prospects for change in the form of Ireland's largest ever regeneration process. But instead, the newsworthiness of the estates emanated from their symbolic association with criminality. From previous interviews conducted with media professionals, we know that the profit orientation of media outlets drives the reporting of crime, bad news sells. The perceived public appeal of the crime story is enhanced, we found, where, it, the, where the criminal incident, which is already newsworthy in itself, is associated by the editor or journalist with a place whose identity as a locus of social disorder is already established in the public mind. So to put this another way, bad news sells, but bad news from a bad place sells faster. It is significant that among national newspapers, only one example of more balanced and I think more critical coverage 
Um, that, that example came from the Irish Times. And it's notable, I think, when we refer back to this idea of political economy and ownership structures, that the Times, of course, is owned by a trust and doesn't pay dividends to shareholders. The Times is also unique in an Irish context in maintaining the position of a social affairs correspondent on staff. And noticeably, the social affairs correspondent authored almost half of the publication's articles on regeneration. So that position mattered and it had real impacts in terms of the kinds of ways um, that these estates were, were covered and were represented to the, the public. Um, in contrast, then, the Irish and the Sunday Independent, a uh, corporate entity whose largest shareholding is owned by a bil busy billionaire businessman, a dense of Ryan, and whose circulation is 50% higher than the <coughs> Times, published only a single article whose primary theme was regeneration. That even in the throes of a major regeneration project, the most widely read national newspaper's interest in the estate centers on associations with criminality, reinforces the significance of a political economy perspective to understanding the nature of media coverage. Unfortunately, the physical, social, and economic boundaries which divide those, in many cases, who live on the estates from those who do not, is such that even in a small town such as Limerick, many people will have no direct experience of the estates. For the majority of Limerick residents, their neighbours in Balnacora Weston and in South Hill are understood through the medium of print and broadcast media, just as they are for people in the remainder of the country. International research literature continues to demonstrate that such negative reputations can in themselves have a profound effect upon the life chances, experiences and self-image of those who live in neighbourhoods which carry stigma. The estates in question are home to a number of organised criminal gangs. Although their activities rarely impact directly upon those living outside of the estates, within the impact of their rivalries, power struggles and recruitment strategies are strongly felt. What media coverage which focuses almost exclusively on crime fails to represent, however, is that this is neither the full extent of the estate's challenges nor of their resources. An exclusive focus on the estates as a locus of criminal activity, such as we see in Ireland's most widely read newspaper, acts to disappear inequalities in education, skills and employment, inequalities which are essential to understanding why involvement in organised crime may appear to be, and I'm quoting Neil Horrigan here, the only visible route out of poverty for, which he refers to as, the disadvantaged of the disadvantaged who in such circumstances will continue to provide what she refers to as the reservoir of the new members for Limerick's criminal gangs. More generally, an exclusive focus on crime has the effect of disappearing the many positive aspe aspects of and attributes of life on the estates, including in some areas very, very strong community spirit and very active grassroots community development initiatives, of which residents are understandably and legitimately very proud and are not represented adequately in, in the media. In a local context, Hurrigan also uh, states that if the media notoriety of Limerick gang leaders is reinforcing their fear-based status, then media coverage which heightens this status is actively contributing to the crime problem in the city. And this is something that the chief executive officer of the, the then Limerick Regeneration Agency also expressed great concern about in terms of the impact in particular of broadcast media portrayal in, in giving local crime a, a platform effectively. The National media's dissemination of and interest in South Hill and Balakur Weston's associations with crime speaks to the existence of what Roquant refers to as a territorial stain. And you will have heard um, Tom Slater talk about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, the capacity of association with place to enhance the newsworthiness of a crime story depends upon the pre existence of a publicly recognised and established stigma what Bacant refers to as a 
nationalised and democratised territorial Spain. Uh, and I note if any of you have been following, um, for instance, Teenage Kicks, I don't know if you watch that, uh, and uh, those amazing uh, musicians from Limerick that he included in his band, um, a number of the, the members in talking about um, their experience of growing up um, in the, the regeneration areas in Limerick spoke incredibly eloquently about the impact of that territorial stain upon their lives. And um, I recall in particular one of the young women uh, who grew up, I think, in, in St. Mary, <coughs> talking about the fact that in order to leave that territorial stain behind, to leave the impact on her life behind, it wouldn't be enough to move out of the estate. It wouldn't be enough to move out of the city that she would actually have to, she felt, leave the country to move far enough away um, from that, that stigmatizing identity to, to escape its impact on her. And in the same, at the same time, and in, and in the same interview, she talks about um, the many very positive aspects um, of life in the locale in which she grows up in. And, and they talk very eloquently about how unfair and how unwarranted um, the humiliated stigma um, that is experienced by those who, who grow up on and live in those estates is. is. Um, so this concept of territorial stain then I, we feel is, is particularly relevant to um, the mediated representations of the regeneration areas. And we feel that it is useful as well in terms of trying to interrogate the rationales behind the rhetorics of elites also who seek to explain the estates of South Hill and Balakur Western through the medium of the newspaper. So not just journalists and editors of the lease, but we're also talking about political elites uh, in particular here. Focusing specifically on these elite framings of the regeneration process, we find that political representatives and public officials express widespread consensus that the challenges faced by South Hill and Balakur Western are fixed in and attributable to place the problems faced by residents are overwhelmingly framed, and we'll just see a few examples there, as individuated antisocial behaviour and criminality, which have been permitted to fester as a consequence of localised poor design and management of housing stock. Elite sources represent residents as ordinary decent victims of malignant place. The disease is the estate, the symptom is criminality and disorder, the cure is renewal of place. The associated and more widespread structural issues of poverty, educational disadvantage and disenfranchisement are all but disappeared in official framings of the impetus for Ireland's largest regeneration project. The roots of these inequalities in redistributive industrial housing and educational policies founded on ideologies of individual responsibility and privilege are quite non-existent. Social regeneration comes to mean supporting localised community development initiatives, which are very important, but the roots of the regeneration area's disadvantage in societal, in structural causes, remains hidden. The problem of state is, as in Foucault's work, extracted from the structural, and indeed the national, it is spatially and politically localised. So what then might be the significance of these mediated framings to understanding the course of Limerick's regeneration processes? Well, to briefly summarise, I suppose as many of you are aware, the process of regeneration has hardly been smooth. Demolition has occurred slowly and in a piecemeal fashion. Houses have been knocked and, state, and sites have been cleared. However, with the exception of two small developments totaling 13 houses and 56 apartments, no new building has occurred to date in the four regeneration areas. Residents who were initially promised a house for a house have instead been relocated to private rented accommodation in the city and surrounding towns. In some cases, they have moved willingly. In other cases, they have done so reluctantly. Those left behind experience varying consequences. Targeted police operations have significantly reduced organised crime and some of the most hazardous housing and wasteland has been eliminated. But other problems have also 
will risen as a result of the slow pace of change, including squatting in and the decay of boarded up houses awaiting demolition, and the more ephemeral issue of the abandonment of isolated households in the desolate landscape of half-demolished streets. For Grant's motif of the territorial stain apparent in elite-mediated discourses regarding the regeneration of states helps us to understand this eventuality, perhaps. We argue that the territorial stain marking these places as abject also marks them out for destruction. In locating the problem in the materiality of the estate, elite sources revealed a rationality which legitimates demolition, but we are concerned that the same rationality may not necessitate reconstruction. Today, two successive governments consisting of four of the five republics, five mainstream parties, have failed to rebuild. The certain rights that all places are haunted by the memory of what they once were. We wonder if Limerick's regeneration states are increasingly deprived of even the capacity to remember, as those who lived there are resettled in better places. Despite promises of renewal, the material consequences of official interventions have been to progressively reduce the residential housing stock and number of residents. This hollowing out, as we understand it, speaks to and is legitimated by the framing of place as a problem. In mediated discourse, to paraphrase Slater, the estate is presented as the cause of the residents' deprivation. With the demolition of the estate comes the elimination of the problem, and so perhaps it also appears to be in reality for the dispersal of residents throughout more affluent areas has the effect of hiding deprivation and its lived reality. The ongoing challenges that they face as a consequence not just of place but of policy are hidden in the haystack of better area-based statistical averages. Disguised among their more affluent neighbours, however, these families continue to be among the most deprived in our nation. Yet, set adrift from place, that deprivation is perhaps made invisible. <coughs> and what I'd like to do is just, if I can, turn off the technology if we have to. Thank you. 